the kingdom of God, specifically how the return of the Lord Jesus Christ relates to that kingdom. And we're going to see that his return to this earth absolutely necessitates or is necessary that God's kingdom might be established. If we were to have a look for a summary in the Bible about the kingdoms of men and, and how they began and how they ran through and how they will culminate in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth and the establishment of God's kingdom, we could probably not do better than our reading this evening and consider Daniel chapter 2 and the dream that Nebuchadnezzar was given. As we read in our reading this evening, Nebuchadnezzar, the ruler of the then world empire of Babylon, was given a dream of an image made of many metals as it went from head to foot. And that dream, as interpreted by Daniel, was an indication to Nebuchadnezzar of the world empires, including his own, that were to continue down through time, culminating in the future, our future, in the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the establishment of God's kingdom. As we read in our reading, this is what Daniel saw. Sorry, this is what Nebuchadnezzar saw, as Daniel interpreted. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part iron and part clay. And so the king was given this image, or this dream of an image, made up of multiple metals. And it had a head of gold. And King Nebuchadnezzar was told specifically that he was that head of gold. He was the gold and the head, and combined as the image, that was he. We're told that in verse 38, at the end of the chapter, Thou, King Nebuchadnezzar, art this head of gold. And that gives us license to interpret this image of Nebuchadnezzar as a sequential list of the kingdoms of men. As we have the head of gold representing Babylon in around BC 600, and then right through time, culminating in what we have today. And so we have a, a head of gold. And that represented Nebuchadnezzar's empire, the, the empire of Babylon. And as the metals went down from head to foot and they became harder and stronger as it went through silver and bronze and then iron, so these kingdoms became more powerful and more powerful. And as the head turned into the arms and shoulders of silver, so the Medo-Persian Empire took over the Babylonian Empire. And down through time, as we go into BC 300s, the belly and thighs of brass took over under the leadership of Alexander the Great. And then the Grecian Empire came to it, came to the fore. And following the belly and thighs of brass, the image went into legs of iron. And down through history, that empire turned into the Roman Empire. And they were the days that the Lord Jesus Christ lived through. But of interest to us is the time period depicted in this image of the feet and the toes. The image of or well, the feet and toes that were made of part iron and part clay. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the time period in which we live. It's not a, an element in its own right, clay. It's not even a, an, a molecule or a compound. It's what we chemically call a mixture. And it's what the kingdoms of men turned into after the Roman Empire, a mixture of nations, particularly as it related to the land of Israel. We have these nations around the place who ruled themselves. But of note, in this clay was a mixture of iron, the remnants of a Roman Empire. And so today we have the nations of Europe loosely held together by the remnants of this Roman, Roman Empire, the Holy Roman Church or the Catholic system. And we're told in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 28 why the king was given this image. We're told in verse 28, But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. He was told what was going to come to pass on this earth. Thy dream and the vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. And so King Nebuchadnezzar was given a glimpse of the world empires starting with his day as they would look flowing through time. But what's important to us 
is not so much the world empires as they flow through time. Well, they are int of interest to us because they, they give us a confidence, having seen that the Bible is exactly accurate. It gives us a confidence when we look at what happened to that image after the feet and the toes or during the days of the feet and toe powers. So Nebuchadnezzar, as he continued to dream, dreamt that this stone cut out of the mountain without hands smote that image and that mountain filled the entire earth and these kingdoms of men became the kingdoms of our Lord Jesus Christ. We read of that in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 35. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors and the wind carried them away and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And what King Nebuchadnezzar was being told in his dream was that the days are coming when the kingdoms of men were actually going to turn into the kingdom of God. And that's quite important because it means or defines for us what the kingdom of God is going to be. The kingdoms of men are going to turn into the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not our interpretation. That's the interpretation that King Nebuchadnezzar was given via Daniel the prophet. And Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar that in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. Unlike the kingdoms of men which one succeeds the other down through time, God's kingdom will have no succession. It will not be left to other people. But it will break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. So it's a, it's a principle that I want you to understand from the very beginning that the kingdom of God is actually the kingdoms of men taken over and ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a kingdom of God based in heaven. It's got nothing to do with heaven going or hell going. It is the kingdoms of men on earth under the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's a summary. We've seen that the kingdoms of men, as we know it, are going to be replaced by what is going to become the kingdom of God. That the kingdom of God is going to be this earth ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ and it's going to fill the whole earth. In fact, in Revelation in chapter 11, we're told that the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And there's that principle reiterated for us that the kingdoms of this earth become the kingdoms of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a summary of what the kingdom comes out of in the future. If we're going to understand the subject of the kingdom of God, we need to understand that it as a subject has its basis with the Lord Jesus Christ and his time on earth some 2,000 years ago. And if we want to understand that subject, we have to put ourselves in the shoes of his disciples. We need to understand the prophecies of concerning the kingdom of God as his disciples understood them. We need to understand the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ as given to his disciples. We need to understand the questions that the disciples asked about the kingdom of God and the answers that they were given about the kingdom. And we then need to look at how the disciples interpreted that subject into their own teachings during the book of Acts. And if we approach the subject of the kingdom of God like that through the eyes of the disciples, I think we'll get to the bottom of the subject of the kingdom of God. And so we're going to see that the, the kingdom of God was very much central to the Lord Jesus Christ and his first mission or his first time on this earth some 2,000 years ago. And we can see that right at the very beginning, well, he wasn't even born yet. And the angel gave a prophecy to his mother, Mary. And that angel said to Mary concerning the Lord Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 1, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. So even before the Lord was born, we can see that the kingdom of God was very central to his mission on earth. And in that quote, we can see once more a definition of the kingdom of God. 
It is the throne that David had on earth, in Israel, in Jerusalem, now occupied by the Lord Jesus Christ. At the very end of his ministry, when he'd been arrested by the, the Jews and interrogated by not only the Jews but the Romans, he said to Pilate, well, Pilate asked him a question, and Pilate said to him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, and he said, Thou sayest I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. So from the very beginning of his ministry to the very end, the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be king on earth was very central to his message and to his mission. So it's not surprising then that throughout his ministry on earth, the subject of the kingdom of God was very central to what he had to say. Here's a couple of examples, both from the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. That was his message. He went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Of all the things that the Lord Jesus Christ taught about, it is singled out that that was his primary message, the kingdom of God. Matthew 9 and verse 35. Jesus went about all cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So who was the audience of this teaching? Well, it was the nation of Israel. It was, it was the leaders in that land. It was his followers. And primarily it was his disciples who were very interested in his teaching on this kingdom. To them it was a very personal message. They understood that the kingdom of God was the Lord Jesus Christ ruling in Israel on David's throne. And so to them, when he was teaching that they would actually be ruling on 12 thrones with him, they were very excited about this coming kingdom. Matthew 19 and verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And you can imagine their excitement as they lined that up with Old Testament scriptures that they had and prophecies concerning the, script, concerning the kingdom of God. And the things that would have come to their mind are quotes like Isaiah 32, which says, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness and princes shall rule in judgment. And they would have put the two together and realised that they were actually those princes that are going to rule with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this doctrine of the kingdom to the disciples was a very exciting doctrine indeed. In John 21 and verse 16, the Lord taught them. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. And he said unto him, Feed my sheep. And so part of the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ to the disciples were that they were going to be shepherds over God's people. That to them was the doctrine of the kingdom of God. And again, they would have lined that up with Old Testament prophecies. For example, Jeremiah 23, which says, And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed, neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. And so the disciples would have taken these Old Testament scriptures and they would have overlaid them with the new teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the kingdom of God and they would have been very excited indeed. Some more Old Testament scriptures that they would have contemplated. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 18. The saints of the Most High, that's them, the disciples, shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Verse 22. Until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints, as to the disciples and the faithful followers of the Lord, the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Verse 27. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall, shall serve and obey him. We have to keep in mind that the time period in which the disciples were living was a hard time for the nation of Israel. They weren't ruling themselves. They were in the leg period of Nebuchadnezzar's image, which is the Roman period. 
And the Jews were under Roman rule. They had Roman rulers actually in Jerusalem. And so part of the vision that the disciples had was the throwing off of this Roman yoke. That to them was very much incorporated into the kingdom of God, that this external power would be driven out of Israel and the Lord Jesus Christ would be established king in Israel, in Jerusalem, on David's throne. And they would have looked to passages in the scriptures like Psalm 149, which says, Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. They could picture themselves doing this, driving the Romans out of Jerusalem, to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written, This honour have all his saints. Praise ye, Yahweh. It's worth noting at the moment that these words were probably misunderstood by the disciples because they haven't had the chance to do this. They didn't get the chance to drive the Romans out and that this is actually still a future prophecy that will apply to the saints. But the, the disciples of the day would have looked at these prophecies and overlaid them with the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ concerning the kingdom of God. And they would have been very excited about the prospect of serving with the Lord Jesus Christ and ruling with him in his coming kingdom. We know the Lord Jesus Christ used parables to get his message across to his disciples. And in his parables was very much this teaching of a coming kingdom. For example, in Luke 19, we read, And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. And in this parable, the Jews would have understood that he's talking about their nation, the nation of Israel, and that his servants are the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, we'll not have this man to reign over us. And they understood that that was the reigning or the ruling parties in the land of Israel, that the scribes and the Pharisees completely rejected the Lord as being a prophet or even the son of God. And they hated him and refused to have him rule over him. And what about these people, these citizens that hated him? Well, Matthew 21, verse 41, tells us their end. They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men, and he will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. Therefore I say unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And the disciples would have interpreted that as meaning that the scribes and the Pharisees and those Jews, the ruling parties who rejected the Lord Jesus Christ as being sent from God, would be removed. And in their place, the Lord Jesus Christ would be inserted as king, ruling in the land of Israel, in Jerusalem, on the throne of David. And the the disciples sitting on 12 thrones ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel. And so if we want to identify who this nation is, this, to whom the kingdom will be given, this nation bringing forth fruits thereof, we have the answer in Luke 12 and verse 32, which says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And so the faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ are identified as the ones to whom that kingdom would be given, that they would be co-rulers under the Lord Jesus Christ in that kingdom. And so if we were to summarise the kingdom of God as taught in the parables, we would see that the nation of Israel, what the nation had in the, what the, nation of Israel had in the days of the Lord Jesus Christ was called the kingdom of God that it was a literal, physical kingdom on earth ruled by people. That the rulership of the kingdom would be taken from the scribes and the Pharisees and those that rejected the teaching of God and his son. That the rulership would be given to faithful followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. That this kingdom was real, a literal and a political kingdom. That God's people, over whom the Lord Jesus Christ is king and who are ruled by righteous people, administering godly principles that's what the disciples understood the kingdom of god to be 
They thought that that was going to happen then and there, and they were super excited that those things were about to come to pass on this earth. Unfortunately, they didn't understand that first the Lord Jesus Christ had to suffer. You can imagine their disappointment as, as time went on and the Lord Jesus Christ was arrested and he went through his trial and then he was crucified and all their thoughts and, and understanding of the kingdom of God was thrown into disarray and they began to question that what they even believed might not even have been the truth. But as time went on, the Lord Jesus Christ was resurrected and at first the disciples had trouble believing that that was even the case. And as certain disciples travelled on the road to Emmaus, after his resurrection, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared unto them. Here's some of the conversation that happened on that road to Emmaus. And those disciples said to the Lord, We trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. We thought the kingdom of God was coming. We thought that the Roman power was going to be pushed out and that the nation of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, was going to be restored under the Lord Jesus Christ as king. That's what we thought. And it's interesting to note that the Lord Jesus Christ had nothing to say to them to contradict that belief. The only admonition or the only thing that the Lord Jesus Christ had to admonish them about was the fact that they didn't understand that he first had to be put to death or that he had to suffer. And so he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and then to enter into his glory? And so the concept of the kingdom of God was not incorrect, but they had their timing wrong. So now that the Lord Jesus Christ had suffered, maybe now the kingdom could be established. And in Acts chapter 1, as they met with the Lord Jesus Christ once more, they asked the question, well, what about now? In Acts 1 and verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And again, we have to note their understanding of what this kingdom is. It is the restoration of the kingdom of Israel on earth. And his answer to them was, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. And given that, the Lord Jesus Christ was taken up from them into heaven. And so their concept of the kingdom of God was not actually incorrect. They thought it was going to appear right away and the Lord Jesus Christ corrected them and says, well, actually, there's going to be a, a period of time before that kingdom is established. And with that, the Lord Jesus Christ was taken from them and he entered into heaven. And pretty much that's where we are today. The Lord Jesus Christ still resides in heaven and we are still waiting for that kingdom to be established on earth. As we read in Acts 1 and verse 19, he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And there are many verses in the New Testament scriptures that tell us that that's exactly where the Lord Jesus Christ went. Mark 16 and verse 19. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Revelation 3 and verse 21. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me on my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. <coughs> Romans 8 verse 33. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God. In 1 Peter 3, verse 21, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. And that's where the Lord Jesus Christ is at the moment. He's residing in heaven at the right hand of God, waiting for the Father to tell him that the time has come for him to return to this earth and establish the kingdom. And in fact, given everything that we've seen about the kingdom of God and the disciples' understanding of the kingdom, and what the kingdom is, and that it is the restored nation of Israel, that it is God's people being ruled by the Lord Jesus Christ in Israel, in Jerusalem, on the throne of David, with some, some saints, including the disciples, co-ruling with him. 
The only narrative that fits is the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth that he might establish that kingdom. The kingdom of God has got nothing to do with souls being immortal or going to heaven or going to hell. It has everything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to this earth and establishing a kingdom on earth. And that's the clear teaching of scripture. Acts 1 verse 11. As they stood there looking at the Lord go up into heaven, the angel said to them, he's coming back. Which also said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which was taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Just as he went up, literally and in full view, he will return to this earth. Literally and in full view. Luke 19 and verse 12 is a parable of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. And the disciples would have gone back over the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ and the parables that he spoke to them. And they would have seen exactly that the Lord Jesus Christ told them that he had to go away, that he had to go into a far country, into heaven, to the right hand of God, to receive for himself a kingdom, and he then would return to them. And with them, with him, he would bring a reward. In Matthew 25, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man travelling into a far country. The Lord had to go into heaven, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with him. And so there are teachings in the parables, if they were to actually read them and understand them, which suggested a period of time where the Lord would be absent. We have the example also of the ten virgins, where five were wise and five were foolish, waiting for the bridegroom to return. And so there are teachings right throughout the New Testament that the Lord Jesus Christ would, after some period, return to this earth. If you go through the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll actually see that there is a period of probation that has to happen while the Lord Jesus Christ is away. That following the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a period where all the earth must be taught the gospel concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. A time period where people have the opportunity to respond and prepare themselves for this coming kingdom. And we have this in Matthew chapter 13. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind. Before the kingdom can come, there has to be this period of the gospel being spread and men being called unto the truth, like a net being spread. And it gathered every kind, which, when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but the bad were cast away. And so following this preaching effort, there will be a judgment at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, where the good are kept in, and received into the kingdom of, of God, and those that are not kept, or the, as, as worded here, the bad are cast away. And Matthew chapter 28 is the very last chapter of the book of Matthew. It's when the Lord Jesus Christ has completed his time on earth. He's been crucified, he's been resurrected, he's been glorified. And it's amongst some of the last words that he said to his disciples. And he said to them, Jesus came and spake unto them the very last words in the book of Matthew, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. And this is the beginning of the casting of that net. At the end of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on earth, that net was cast out, and so began this gathering period, fishers of men calling people to the truth. And at the culmination of that time period, the kingdom of God would be established. And so the disciples heard all these things. They would have mulled them over and put, put all the pieces together and, and come to some sort of understanding of the kingdom of God. And so when we look at what the apostles, as the disciples became taught throughout the New Testament, we can see that they fully contemplated the Lord Jesus Christ to return and restore all things and bring with him the kingdom. And so we see, in, we read in Acts chapter 3, that the apostles said, 
He shall send Jesus Christ, which was before, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things. And you can see that the understanding of the apostles on the subject of the kingdom has not changed, that they still understand the kingdom of God to be a restoration of the nation of Israel, and that those events have simply been shifted forward or shifted back until the Lord Jesus Christ might return to this earth. And when he does return to this earth, they still fully expect a restoration of the nation of Israel. In 1 Peter 5, we read, and Peter wrote, The elders which were among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and I witness, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory which shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, and when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And so the understanding of the apostles turned into a fervent expectation that the Lord Jesus Christ would return to this earth. And when he does come, he'll bring with him a reward, a crown of glory to all people that are expecting his coming. Certainly that was the teaching and understanding of the Apostle Paul, who wrote in 2 Timothy, Henceforth, well, we'll start at the beginning, I fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith, says Paul. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not to me only, but to all them also that love his appearing. And so the Apostle Paul was longing for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to this earth, that he might receive that crown of glory which he, might, which he will get in the coming kingdom of God. The Lord Jesus Christ left us with a final message in the final book of the Bible, the Revelation. It's a, a book that he wrote but was penned <coughs> by John after the Lord Jesus Christ had ascended into heaven. And the message he left us with was, Behold, I come quickly, hold fast that which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Behold, I come quickly was the Lord's final message to us. Revelation 22 and verse 7, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the saying of the prophecy of this book. Again in chapter 22 and verse 12, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. And verse 20, He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen, even so, come Lord Jesus. And so the final message that Lord Jesus Christ gives to us is that he is coming back, and he's coming back quickly. And blessed is the man therefore that watcheth and keepeth his garments. And the obvious question to ask, isn't it, is when will the Lord Jesus Christ come back? If he is coming back quickly, when is it? And the short answer is that we don't know the time or the season when the Lord Jesus Christ will return. It's not given us that we might understand those things. But we can look at scripture and we can understand things like the Nebuchadnezzar's image in Daniel chapter 2, that we are living in the days of the feet power with those toes that are part, part iron and part clay. And we can understand that we are living in relatively the right time period. And we can look at other things like Genesis chapter 1 and the parable of creation to see that God has a plan and a purpose with this, this earth that gives mankind 6,000 years and that following 6,000 years will be a seventh 1,000 year period, which is the kingdom of God. And we know throughout history, or because of history, that we are living somewhere towards the end of that, that 6,000 year period. And so the Lord Jesus Christ could be at any time. There's no doubt about that. But the message that we should take to ourselves is that of the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation 16 where he says, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth. And the message of the scripture to us is that even though we don't know when the Lord Jesus Christ is returning, we have to live like he could be here tomorrow. We have to live like men that wait and are in earnest expectation of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and that that could even be tomorrow. That's what the Lord teaches us in Luke chapter 12. He says, let your loins be girded about. It's an old phrase referencing old long clothing that should be girded up 
that might prepare one to work or to run a race. And he's telling us that if we're going to wait for the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to put ourselves to work in the service of God. Loin, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Come to an understanding of the Bible and of God and of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and his purpose that he has with this earth, and then be a light to those around you concerning those things. Put yourselves to work in the service of God and be a light to those around you. And ye yourselves, like unto men that wait for their Lord. That's the exhortation that the Lord gives us, that we have to live like men that wait in earnest expectation for a Lord that could return even tomorrow. And when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. <coughs> Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. We have to be ready for his return. And if he comes and we are ready, blessed is us. And if he shall so come in the second watch and in the third watch. And the point of that is that the Lord Jesus Christ's return is at an appointed time. And that time is not changing. But if we are watching, it matters not if it is in the second watch or the third watch. Because we are expecting him as if he could come tomorrow. And if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we've seen tonight conclusively that the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth to establish God's kingdom. We've seen that it is a real, literal kingdom to be established on earth. That the Lord Jesus Christ will be king in Israel in Jerusalem on the throne of David and that his faithful followers will help him rule over the earth and that kingdom will fill the whole earth and it will last forever. We don't know when these things will be accomplished but one thing is for certain is that to accomplish them the Lord Jesus Christ must return to this earth and that could be at any stage. And so ladies and gentlemen hopefully that has set forth to you the message of hope that is contained in the Bible and I urge you, ladies and gentlemen, to look further into these things before time runs out. Thank you for your time this evening.